Lotan Levkovich, how are you doing, my man? Uh, not bad, you know, given the circumstances. <laughs> What circumstances? <laughs> yeah, as I tell many people, it's not the best year we ever had, mm. uh, but... Uh, but you're optimistic, I can sense. I am optimistic, not about the immediate term, but in the grand scheme of things, zoom out a lot, I think we are trending up in the most important things. Mm. Um, I must say that in, in some of them, it's ju just because you just hit rock bottom. <laughs> So it's easy to go up if you're like so low, but... Uh. Do you know what the jokes on VCs are compared to like other asset class investors, like let's say hedge funds? They say VCs are always optimistic long term and hedge funds, they always panic about the short term. Why? Because, you know, the model of how it works, right? You guys invest in companies for a long run. You guys want to get some sort of liquid event down the road and, um, and you guys have time on your hands. Um, but not time on your hands if you want to raise your next fund during the current fund that you're doing. So it's kind of like a mixture. Um, you are one of those names of the rising VC stars. Am I? Would you say? I would say so. I would say so. You hear your name. You're doing great work. Gov is doing great work. And you're very young in, the, in this industry. You know, you're close to 40. Um how did you get into this industry? I think it's a, uh, it's a nice story. So I, let's say, let's put it this way. When I started 12 years ago, I was really, really young. <laughs> I knew nothing about nothing, I guess. Um, but I stumbled upon this industry. Stumbled upon. I met uh, a guy I really admired when I was young, a guy named Dov Moran. Dov was, mm. was one of the founding fathers of the industry. And as a very geeky kid that uh, was living next to Farsaba, Dov and his company M Systems that were in Farsaba, so, you know, I saw like the logo on their building every day uh, on my way to school. And back then, you know, the thumb drive, like USB stick, the disc on key. Right was something we all used. He was like our local Steve Jobs. So <laughs> 12 years ago, I found my way to meet him. Uh, so maybe you can give me an advice about my future life. With, by the way, with zero expectations, because I thought like, what on earth can he do with me? But <laughs> we had, I think because I didn't have any expectations, we had like good chemistry, I was a bit more relaxed. And uh, they said, you know what? Maybe I can do something about you. <laughs> maybe we can do something uh, together. And then like, I clicked it like, <laughs> yes, like, uh, take me, I really like, uh, I didn't leave him too much choice, uh, but take me as his right hand. And big thing, what we did back then was investing, like some sort of like super angel investing, maybe. And from uh, his own private funds. Yeah. Back then it was the own private funds. And that was fascinating because we were investing in founders. Some of them had some ideas, some of them not, some of them brilliant things brilliant things some of them i look back and i said like oh my god what on earth what did we think um and then i think that um for many years i looked for something for this like spark an industry a domain that i would be captivated by yeah so i think uh back then i realized like actually i if i'm not working i want to read more about this area like this is like this is a hobby for me. It's work. If I can actually make my life combined in a way that that's going to be everything that I do, that's a good life. <laughs> so we then uh, I had to convince him to start a VC fund. At the beginning, I, I gave him like, "Hey, what do you say? Like, uh, let's bring other people money." <laughs> it's like me VC, no way. <laughs> I'm a founder. I hate VCs. They were like uh, <laughs> killing me as a founder all my life. <laughs> and then. Um, for a year and a half, I did what every founder should do at the beginning of his business is, is validation. I did mm. like ideation. I talked with many people, asked them, so what is a VC, what does it actually means? I met like LPs, GPs, trying to like to give some uh, wisdom. Mm -hmm. Some of them told me the truth. <laughs> <laughs> some of them just, uh, you know, uh, said the me. buzzwords and kind of... Yeah. Um, but then a year and a half in, I said, like, uh, had a more like, established, like, vision and strategy. And we, like, uh, and was generous enough to say, you know what, let's do it together. You can, like, be my partner. <laughs> and uh, that was, uh, 
about almost like 10 years ago but we were really like up and running like eight years ago mm. and uh but actually like uh, now i have like the best job ever the best life ever did you w when you guys fundraise did you did you fundraise you specifically or did you let dov like do the whole work no we like was like we together both, yeah, 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 yeah 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 um though i might say we really um improved our game and that front because mm. we had no idea what we were doing at the beginning in some areas we were really spot on we had a uh, very good um understanding of the market and something like how the world gonna look like in the next 10 now i can say like 10 years because we're already 10 yeah. years now is in the present but how the israeli vc landscape looks like when there's some gap so i think th this was a very good read but other areas about how we tell our story for example mm uh it was embarrassing really yeah but how complicated can it can it be you basically say listen i know what's going to happen i'm going to make you lots of money isn't that kind of like the pitch so we started to talk about values oh values there are like two core values until today in grow ventures it's people first mm. in people is like it's us mm -hmm. like how we deal with our partners and employees the founders we invest in our investors like really it's first it's always about the people and second is about creating value Yes, it's a financial value, but we believe that the financial value is going to be a very, very good byproduct if mm. you create value to everyone around us. It's about like, how do you work for the founder? How do you make sure that you bring in all this like added value to everything you do with him? It's hmm. like people like you meet, you know, in your day to day life. And um, so I think these are still great values to have, but when an investor come to meet a fund <laughs> that's not necessarily good should be like the first 10 minutes of the conversation right especially in a big institutional one right yeah they don't yeah and because they also hear that that this value conversational you know you're coming in you're like their sixth or seventh meeting for the day and all they want to do is just find an easy way to allocate that money right so yeah. that's that, that how it goes yeah and i'll give you another example like um so our our strategy since day one was in three um, core pillars that we believe that is the foundation for the next revolution, the next data revolution the world is going through. Mm -hmm. First is around the edge, when the physical world becoming digital. We used to call it more like IoT back then. It was more internal things. Like, so that, was very, that was a very sexy term, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah back then. I'm still waiting to see what hap what what's going on yeah. with the IoT, right? Yeah, yeah, but but, <laughs> but so but, but we, we do believe that new smart sensors, new things, the digitalization of supply chains, energy transition still like tons of value to, to be uh, but then like um some lps ask us like really semiconductors hmm. you know that 90s are over <laughs> um tell that to nvidia yeah that's so now <laughs> you know i just been in a conference like a month ago in germany and every second guy is like what do you like what do you do i i invest in deep tech like really deep tech because back then we had to explain people like what is deep tech what is shallow tech right Second area when we invest is like infrastructure, like when buyers are very technical, um, DevOps, DevTools, like uh, cloud infrastructure. And people tell us like, you know, that technical people are not necessarily the best customers. Like <laughs> it was before all the wave that you like, see what's happening now with like uh, all the products from companies like Datadog or GitHub Copilot that's now exploding. But back then we had to convince them that it's actually a more um, um uh, that most of the power of the, the buying power in the world going to be driven right by technology buyers like um aws was still not where it, it is today mm -hmm. and i think in the bay area it was maybe a more conventional wisdom just starting mm -hmm. in israel definitely not third area and that's a funny one we wanted to invest in, in artificial intelligence ai oh and back what, then, what is that so, so yeah they told us <laughs> That's that's a Steven Spielberg movie, right? Like, uh, <laughs> are you investing in science fiction? They said, like, no, 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 AI. And, and we had to explain. So we had to change the term to applied big data, because then it sounds like, hmm, that's that sounds smart. So, <laughs> but all this like storytelling and explanation, it's something we didn't know how to do at the beginning. And the reception at the beginning was that we were a bit of a weird animal in the jungle. Hmm. It took some time for us to crystallize the message and for, for to bring some more results and we had a cold start and since then uh, things uh been moving a bit faster i guess that is amazing and you guys are i think are finding this intersection between deep tech semiconductor and ai 
which that is basically the acceleration of what we're seeing with Nvidia, what we're seeing with other similar publicly traded stocks that are in the same kind of field. We, we you even see Sam Altman, you know, what he wanted to do with his, he wanted to build a seven trillion uh, uh, dollar company that is that is based on creating semiconductor ch uh, chips that support AI. So you know, this is definitely. So you guys definitely had a good vision and clear vision. Yeah. Where did that vision come from, though? Like, because you know, so what is it? You've been reading about things 10 years ago and you were like hey this is going to be the next big thing um why well, are you just saying this now because this is what's going on i can show the first presentation <laughs> uh, by the way the design of the presentation not something i'm proud of but uh <laughs> the strategy was was there um i think that what we have seen back then that a lot of the vc market was by the way very small compared to today like the number of people that could actually write a round checks was like 10 or 15 in israel something mm -hmm. like that that's probably like, I don't know, 90, 100. Um, and the themes that they were following were, I think, very narrow. There was always like, in the 90s, you may have like uh, the, te the telecommunication <laughs> uh, theme or, you know, in the last few years, like cyber theme. But many companies that we thought that ha make sense, that have something good to offer, just couldn't find the right home. So we hmm. said like, hey... Um, we are happy to be a bit um, contrarian and if we take these like weird projects and eventually be right <coughs> hey maybe that's gonna be like great so we we i think we structured the fund to have a more a better like um risk appetite hmm. and you know the contrarian thinking is how every vc should operate no because the whole model of vc is you basically you know, it's not, well, I mean, Bessemer are a bit different because they're more strategic kind of exit led. By the way, they just had Quack exiting to JFrog, which is a very nice one. Quack is a former client of our company. Um, so I'm really proud of them. Um, and, but, you know, the contrary thinking is, well, you're looking for one company out of 10 or two companies out of 10 who are basically gonna outshine the, the rest and the rest don't really matter. So, you know, isn't, why isn't, so my question is why isn't every vc fund contrarian in the sense of their approach why 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 is that a weird thing why was that weird for grove why was grove seen as a different kind of animal when every type of vc should be that kind of animal because it's freaking hard <laughs> and it's freaking scary because um you know i always tell our investors that we want to be contrarian once <laughs> we can be contrarian again in the same company if we stay contrarian after that we are just wrong <laughs> uh but uh i mean that let me give you an example um when i met the founders of navina mm -hmm. six years ago they just uh finished they've been like in their last days of the intelligence corps like service they built a multi-model AI systems, won awards, everything. They knew a lot about AI, but nothing about the rest of the world. Mm. But I really liked them. We had a very good vibe. We had very good chemistry. And I said, like, hey, take some money and let's build the company together. So we went and went through um, and connected them to a few people in manufacturing. We had some thesis there. Didn't work. To the energy markets. Didn't work. And then in healthcare. And they said, like, you know what? We feel in our guts mm -hmm. that we, where we should go. We built like two concepts, one in intensive care, one in primary care. And then we decided to focus and to hone in like into primary care. But then we went to a lot of um, healthcare provider like uh, clinics. And we thought like we actually believe that now is the right time to bring AI for the physician, mm -hmm. for the doctor, when he meets his patient. But at the point of care, this is where the magic should have happened. And all like the healthcare veteran investors so like like you know guys you're you're great you're nice um but uh if you want to solve this problem you should either sell to the insurance company the payer mm. or to the patient right no one sells to the doctor he have no money <laughs> and but we had we said like we've been like in the market we saw them so we actually think that's the right way to go and i told them like uh listen if we don't get like all the fancy like know-it-all healthcare investors so here's more money Let's double down. Let's do it. To tell you that that was not like shaking uh, the, the the second before, 
yes. <laughs> that I tell, um, of course, there's some eyebrows in the fund. I was like, really? Do we think that we... And I think like now, four years later, we were right. But it was very, very scary at the beginning because there was no like playbook right. to follow. So it's more... It's But it's... But it's more the mental side. No, it's, it's not on the rash. Is it the rational side, or is it just because it's scary? Because no, it's this because, whole profession no, is kind of scary. You need, you need to roll up your sleeves mm -hmm. and to build your own mental framework. You need to build your own network. You need to build your own understanding, because there's not too many like comparables to, to follow. Mm -hmm. Right. And you know, you mentioned something uh, nice earlier in the conversation. You know, you guys want you have you have these values, and I'm not saying this in a cynical way. I'm saying this. This is very nice, and hopefully, it it, it does make sense, and hopefully, more people are are you know aligned with their values, and you know have integrity into their values. Um, and you say va those values also get you know translated into who you guys choose to invest in, right? The founders. And I find it quite uh, interesting because a lot of the founders that I love and that I love a lot and the founders that I would want to invest in and the founders that we have invested in are not the most value-driven um, founders. They're usually uh, sometimes uh, quite assholes and not the most uh, fun people to hang around with, but, I, but I'm very um in love with the way they run a company what, what do you say about that do you, do you feel like when you say that you invest in you know value-driven founders what is what does that look like what's important to you in a founder um yeah so i think that one of the things i've learned in my journey in the venture capital industry is that it's okay to have an independent voice and to have my own way of working so I've I've learned that um, for the longevity of our fund and of my career <laughs> and uh, my drive, I need to work with the people that they share not all the value system, but at least some. And I, because my involvement post my investment is quite deep i mean like i invest only in one or two companies per year that's all mm -hmm. but when i invest i spend tons of time with the team with the market uh i go with them to conferences i i think with them quite a lot so and i i want to work with people i actually like spending time with hmm. and i know that some founders some of the most like you know legendary founders are assholes <laughs> i probably not gonna be the one investing with them really i think what do, what do your lps think about that though because you're basically saying like an lp doesn't care because he doesn't need to work with the founder yeah um i think that you cannot be everything for everyone mm -hmm. but if you know what you're looking for hmm. it's like can, dating it's like can, finding the right person for exactly. you exactly huh? i think there's like some great founders and actually i, I when, when i I'm a, look uh, you asked me what i look for in a founder so i look for founders that I wanted to work for. Hmm. I was actually working for my founders. I want to bring my friends to work for my founders. Actually, that's not what I do. Um, all of my friends like laughing at me that I'm kind of like... Uh, You're more like an HR guy than, uh, exactly. than a VC. <laughs> like, I'm, I think on average, like uh, three to five of my, I would say not close, but kind of close network work in every one of my portfolio companies. Because if I believe in them... Is, is I that their vision, vision though? Oh, no, 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 <laughs> not at all, because I'm not the one hiring them. Right, right, of course not. I'm not, I'm not yeah, I'm just, uh, it's very easy sell for me. Um, for both sides. Yeah, because I already, I put my money where my mouth is, right? Like, uh, yeah. I believe in these guys, I believe in their vision, I believe that this company is going to be the next great thing. So, it's easy for me to get a piece of people that I really appreciate and love, and which I think are amongst, like, you know, the top top one percent and you also have great connections by being in the industry for for quite a bit and working with this fabulous company so i'm sure you know great engineers and great you know uh management c-level uh, yeah, executives ex exactly so that's yeah. so that's a very natural thing in terms of the founder itself though what, what what attracts you to a founder is it are you into is it the charisma is it the domain expertise more is it the is it just the team he surrounds himself with is that a bigger factor what kind of ticks your box so me and in grove we have we're investing in two types of investments let's, mm -hmm. let's put it this way and then i'll explain dive more into the founder 
it's in areas that we think or um, or we chose to be leaders in mm -hmm. markets that we believe that we are the best fund a founder can dream of. Mm -hmm. And then we have a lot of understanding of the market trends. We have good, very good network. Um, for example, in like software infrastructure, DevOps, DevTools, I know many people get bored. I'm not. <sighs> I'm like, I'm like <laughs> I don't know, I like to geek out in those areas. And like, have you always been a geek? Yeah, I guess so. Not like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so two years ago, I said like, hey, many people in Israel invest in like those areas, but I, th I think I'm more fascinated by these things. So I built my own like council of like, Dev council, like people that built companies, worked for companies in that area. We talked with them quite a while, like quite a lot, like trying to imagine how the world is going to look like. We have our network of like engineering executives. We built our research. We call it like Chief Tappins, which is a very geeky joke about Chief Left, if you know what I mean. <laughs> if not, it's okay. I don't. Um, Chief Left is about how you um, transfer responsibility and tasks to the left side of the development life cycle. Mm. If you think about it as factory, left side is developers, right side is ops. Okay. Ops. Okay. Anyways, Chief Left, anyway, Chief, Chief Tappins, it's like, did a masterclass event, brought like people that founded like great companies, led the engineering, like great organizations, and they just shared their experience. We had a research done about it when we build a framework of how we evaluate all the companies in that world. That was lots of work, but it was lots of fun. Hmm. And now I think in, the, in that market, for example, in that domain, and by the way, in the first time I lost money in a backend as a service company was like more than 10 years ago. So <laughs> I've been quite a while um, dealing with, with these things, even though I'm not, not writing code for the last like 20 years. Um, when I meet the founder, very easy for me to see him interact both with my understanding of the market. I see how he answer his question. I see how he questioned the market, hmm. how he evaluate that. And then I, it's very easy for me to introduce him to all the relevant buyers and to see their feedback. Hmm. Cause in those categories, I'm, I'm like, this is what I do. Like I talk with the engineering leaders day in, day out. Hmm. And then I, it's easy for me when something, I remember my first meeting with Elad Ben, ben Israel from uh, Wing Cloud. Elad before uh, founding Wing was uh, the head of, uh, in AWS CDK, like the biggest open source of AWS. And when he described to me his vision of how the next generation of the cloud programming should look like, and his very big vision about how to close the gaps between developers and DevOps. Anyway, I, I said like, I was just hooked. It's like, hmm. finally, someone shows some clarity. And honestly, when I told it to other people or to you or to my par partners, they were like, boring. <laughs> anyway, so, but for me, it was very easy to validate it and to run with them and to help them like to get this like thing into more concrete uh, roadmap. So this is like one way I evaluate founders when I believe I have some added value, like, like for example, semiconductors, it's very, it's part of what we do. We meet all the founders in semiconductors. In Israel, it's very easy for us to do the validation and to work with them and then to see if we should be the one leading the round. Second area is when we are, I would say, more pioneering. When we are happy uh, to be the one who jump into the pool and pray that there's water uh, <laughs> in the end. Uh, Clean and, water, I hope. Yeah, and, and then the interaction with the founders um, about like, how do we evaluate new markets and these like new frontiers? I can learn quite a lot about how the founder founder gonna interact and build his company throughout the, the next like ten years. So, so it's more about the the founder's uh, conviction about the market or his correct assessment based on your assessment on the, how the market looks like, and not a, and and what about his personality? Is there something specific about his personality? Because I don't know. I'm just. By the way, I, I don't have a good. I, I, I don't have a good answer for this, but let's say you have a founder who has a really great conviction he, and he knows what's going to be in his market. He has great deep domain expertise. Does it truly matter how effective he is as an individual in terms of execution or something? Or sometimes if the idea is really good and fits the narrative, it's not such a thing because I tell you why. So just to, uh, uh, some context, you know, my dad is in semiconductor in Cisco. Um, he's quite legendary in that field. You know, he's been, he was in Galileo who sold yeah. to Marvel and, you know, from Marvel, he went to, to Cisco and, you know, and they just know that, you know, even talking about 
companies, even like Mellanox, who sold to NVIDIA, like, sometimes the product is not ideal. And yeah. it takes time. But if you're in the general right direction in deep tech, it works. So yeah. do you feel what I'm trying to what mm -hmm. I'm trying to ask you is this, do you feel like if a founder is right and has a good conviction, does it truly matter who the founder is or does the idea win by itself eventually? Yeah, so m we invest super early. Mm -hmm. And super early like uh, more than half of the companies I invested in, I invested before the company had an idea. Hmm. So I'm more in the camp of in the very very early stage the idea i would not would not say doesn't matter at all mm -hmm. but it's not where most hmm. of the value or the thing i'm trying to understand is i'm trying to understand more the founder capability to learn and adapt and adapt mm -hmm. and to build within the new the need and the market to find the right need to find the hmm. right market his curiosity his speed his ability to attract the right customers and, and employees and executives and to really, really um, adapt to the right thinking and understand from feedback, learn which feedback should say like, nah, hmm. I don't know anything or and have another feedback that's going to change all the course of his life. Hmm. So I usually have a lot of data points before I invest in a new team. I, for example, that's, that really like saved me from in the more hypey days of the market of like making like 48 hours decisions and I was never on that camp. I was always like, I, I need to know you before. Like <laughs> I have to date you. Like I met my wife when I was like 37. So I always like took my time before really? I commit. Yeah. 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 Did, did, did you have many relationships before that? Um, I, I did have some quite few like serious relationships, but I think that um, was so COVID. I, I was always thinking that I have a place for that in my life and I did like marriage yeah like yeah but i think i was kind of like married to the fund <laughs> since growth started that was like my baby or my my this was the main thing i did and then when covid started i fl i flew last i had some more time in israel so and then i met my wife and uh that the best uh thing happened i'm and, I'm, I'm 28 and i'm still single i was actually about to get married and did and decided that it was not the right uh fit for me but it's interesting uh, it feels like i can take my my time and wait you know, well, no, <laughs> I, 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 I think it's very individual and it's, uh, you have, you don't need to follow like, there's a, no playbook. You mean exactly. It's exactly. just finding the right person. Cause you only need one. So it's not like an, a VC portfolio, right? hundred percent. Yeah. Which is interesting. Um, you know, you're a very busy guy. Um, I, I bet, I don't know. I, I'm not with you in the day today, but I'm sure you're quite busy. How do you handle your day? How do you manage your, your productivity? How do you make sure you work on the right things and not get eaten away by the fluff and the, and the unnecessary? So a few of my VC friends laugh about me that, uh, I work too much because <laughs> I really enjoy what I'm doing. You don't go skiing. As a VC, yeah, you heard, don't spend your time. I heard that VCs like all about yachts and uh, skiing they and go all skiing, these like, things. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, not me. Like uh, <laughs> you actually I used, work. I, I I used to have more fun until I became a father and I had a family. I used to travel more. Now I I do have lots of fun, but just with my kid. Mm -hmm. like, I I, uh, I I love it. We have a great family. So and but and also like all the time I spend. So I I think relatively speaking. Most of my time, I dedicate to the relationships I already have, mm. to the founders I already invested in, to the to the markets I'm really fascinated by, to thinking like where the world is going to. I think I spend less time on finding the next next best mm. thing. Like I, I'm I'm seeing a lot of like great founders. Many people introduced to me like uh, people that just really early on their journey because I'm happy like to see things before they're formalized. Right. And I'm happy like to help people like with the ideation phase. Um but I manage my time in a way that uh I I think I have more at least like 20, 30 years in that role as mm -hmm. long as I'm going to keep enjoying what I'm doing. Hmm. So I keep to balance, not the number of hours I'm spending, but the quality of time I'm spending. Hmm. So I'm not coming back exhausted from a day. I'm coming energized. When I'm coming back home, my friends, we sit. This is what we talk about. Hmm. 
when I have more time, when I walk to the office, which, by the way, a great privilege to walk to work. Um, it's also I'm very listening. healthy, and your Apple Watch probably likes it. Yeah, when they, uh, yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> uh, by the way, it's a gift we got to all the fund uh, employees. Uh, we think that's, that's the right, uh, the best branding is like getting them to walk more, maybe. <laughs> anyway, so I'm listening to podcasts or having calls about work because that's my hobby. That's what I like to do. So the, I think the best productivity hack that I realized that if you really like what you're doing, you never work. <laughs> you're very, very productive. Are you more like a to-do list guy, a calendar-driven guy, both? Or is it just a lifestyle? Um, by the way, A, it's a lifestyle. Yeah. B, uh, I'm involved in so many different things. So I have this like inbox zero kind mm -hmm. of mentality. Every task that is happening to me in my life as an email either from someone to me or from me to myself and by the end of the day i always know what are the unread or the to-do hmm. list that are not being done so you literally email tasks to yourself lutan call him call this yeah. yes yes uh and um i'm i'm trying not to miss uh almost anything i think i'm i'm not the best but i think i'm not bad at that at that yeah, front not dropping the ball and not dropping the ball exactly uh, and I'm also trying to be very cautious before I get myself into a new project. Because hmm. if it's not going to dedicate, I, I, I cannot dedicate a lot of my time, probably not going to do it. Because hmm. there's a, some cost to everything of, of, of that nature, right? Exactly. That's the reason I'm investing like in one or two companies hmm. per year, because I want to be really all in, in all in with them in the moment, really understand. So I can be able like, to go with them like to a conference in a year that... You know, I just did it with one of my founders like uh, a month ago in Austin, Texas. That's a lot of time, but it right. was great fun because it got me to understand even more what's happening within his uh, his market. Um, but I I don't think I can do it in a very large scale because then because there's only one of you. Uh, exactly. So <laughs> it's about choosing what not to do. So it's quality over quantity for you. To hopefully, to produce more quantity. Yes, <laughs> I think that you know? if you if you select what you get because. Um, being a VC sometimes can be like an endless candy store. Everything is somehow interesting mm. and many smart people. But if you really want to, I think, achieve something, you need to make sure which assets you're buying and which assets you're creating for you as an individual and then how you keep like growing them. Mm. And um, I think I, I've realized that there's like two types of, uh, of investors experts investors and ever ever learning investors and i think the it's more productive to be an ever learning one yeah makes sense because the world moves all the time and things uh, correct uh, shift as you say shift happens mm -hmm. you know what books have influenced you your thinking Oh, wow. I am. You're very, you're, uh, I'll say this to the audience. You're very intellectual, very smart. I talked to you before, you know, I'm really interested, yeah. you know, uh, you, you can be humble if you want, but y I'm really interested of what kind of shaped your, your views about things. I, I, I would take a guess that the books that have influenced you were not necessarily business related books. Um, I, you know, um, not necessarily. Mm -hmm. There's a bit of both because, uh, <clears throat> There are some books that uh, I always like keep keep few copies mm. on my, near my desk. That every time I meet like one of my founders, it's like okay, take this, please, <laughs> please read that. Um, but th yeah, these are not necessarily going to be um, parenting books, for example. <laughs> um, but let's see. Uh, the, I, I, I'm going to try to give like from the top of my head. Um, and you, you said like okay. Um, Let's start with parenting one. I am a very data-driven person, and I, I I think it was very uh, important for me to learn parenting about, in a data-driven uh, way. Exactly, expecting better in crib sheets by Emily Oster. That was like a very data-driven way to look at all the research regarding parenting. That's what, that was one. Regarding um, building a firm, building a culture, as like who is Michael Ovitz? That Michael Ovitz, that uh, if you know him, Ad Adele, no. No, 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 it, no. It no. Was, it was in, one of the biggest like talent agents in Hollywood. That he did. Oh, Michael Ovitz. Yes, of course. Yeah, he yeah, uh, helped like build and Jason Horowitz. That his way, the way he talked, right. about how he built his business is phenomenal. Yeah, he's like the um, Emmanuel. Uh, yeah, 
yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a big good talented Hollywood guy. Yeah. I think that uh, every time I I, saw, I see someone like either in Grove one of my portfolio that I think is need to understand like how I believe our fund should or our company should look like at the culture and how you act on it. Like please read that and. Um, I think uh, thinking in bets. Mm, also, that's a good one. You know what? No, yeah, of no course. One. Yeah, that's a great one. Um, of course, like the classical one, like zero to one of Peter. Peter, feel like the great uh, Peter. Yeah, um, I can go on and on. Like, uh, but let's um, give you an, uh, the, one of the newest one. It relates to something that is we're as uh, I think civilians of the democracy, the modern world is like dealing with, especially us as Israelis in the last year. It is the cuddling of the American mind by uh, Jonathan Haidt. Oof, that's a very good one. Yeah, that is uh, a very very good one. Jonathan Haidt is amazing. That's a very good book. Takes me to my next question. Trump Biden, my friend, what's going on? Are we going yeah. to win? Um, and who is this we? Who is we? Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so first a disclaimer. I'm I have a U.S. passport, so I can vote. But I'm Israeli, so I don't think that I should vote if I don't gonna deal with most of the consequences. Mm, but it is, but there is consequences for you. Yeah, as an Israeli, but um, hundred percent no? because it's you know the leaders of the free world, right? Yes, we're in um, we're the we're an American state. Um, I don't know about that, but um, <laughs> I would say this: um, it's not my field of expertise, but uh, I would say that. After like talking with a lot of my friends that been in the U.S., I think that uh, the blue side is getting very confused. What oh. it actually means to support uh, the demo like Democratic like Party these days, and also the Republicans, I think, not really happy with the current leadership of the Republican Party. And I think it's a very like specific individual phenomena of a bigger thing that is happening. But um, how democracies act in the field of this like data revolution. And there is um, there is this like equation which is very vicious that I believe in. So hold with me for a second here. The cost of content creation as humanity moves forward, dropping slowly to zero right the cost of like the marginal like the next article you want to publish zero zero right right the cost of distributing content higher but dropping to zero really think about the first days uh you want to distribute content you had to write in the cave then right. maybe write a letter maybe send it with a, with a pigeon and then you can send it like snail mail right like email now with a one click and have a campaign and run to like on twitter or like or twitter yeah LinkedIn, yeah this but you, times but you, that interesting means that the ability for me to manipulate very big audience is becoming an unstoppable phenomena and one of the things and one of the core principles of free speech have two sides i have the free speech another side have the freedom to listen or to understand what is being told and i think right now if manipulation is cheaper than just sharing I would say true truth maybe no no or not no but most of the people involved in democracy just don't have the tools or data to take a very informed decision so it's not a game of whose idea is better it's becoming a game of which manipulation is stronger faster larger really you do believe that in terms of you know I'm just seeing how much time we have. We have two more minutes, so I'm, I'm. I can talk about this with you for an hour, but you don't think that today there's a concrete data. Dri you're a data-driven individual. I think that I unfortunately, think fortunately, mm -hmm. all of us are being subjected to a lot of manipulation. Really, but the if, borders, the people coming in from the borders. Think, if you think that you know the truth about most of the things you have opinion on, I would challenge that. Hmm. And I think in the last five years, we're going uh, like around like from like COVID vaccines and uh, Hunter Biden, if you want to talk about elections, that what was con taken as uh, what people thought is like the obvious reality and what's been happened, like what people discovered later. It means that we have a problem and not too many media outlets to your uh, other like side of the business and not too many people in the world 
actually can give us the truth. No, they can't because they are they're incentivized to do differently. Yes, especially but, in the U.S. And yes, but should, if I, all all the people that should guard us uh, are not there, and by the way, in the online realm, I invested in a company called Active Fence, and that is exactly what they do. They try to just remove all the hostile and fake behavior on the web. Not trying to say what's what's true and what's not, but you know as. Galileo Galilei said that the world is round and they've been hanged for that because it was fake news. I think it's a phenomenon that's going to keep going and going, just know it, but in bigger magnitudes. Hmm. So I think to your to your question, sorry, I kind of like no, went aside yeah. about around democracy. I think that our challenge is not uh, Biden or, or Trump, or by the way, I, I still believe that's going to be a third guy. Hmm. Uh, Maybe, um, maybe maybe the destroyer of California, Gavin Newsom, is going to come in. <laughs> uh, again, uh, I just think that we have a more found, a foundational problem that uh, we are seeing now the waves happening in Europe. What's happening in the, the, the I think the sickness we all have from these processes, going to at one point going to help us to find uh, a less bad system. I hope I hope we find someone uh, right, and I hope you uh, vote for the right person for you. I know who I would want to vote. Lotan, thank you so much, man, for thank taking the much, time. Man. Hope to see thank you soon you. on the show. You're amazing. Keep up the great work, and people follow him on LinkedIn. Thank you very thank much. Thank you Ray. so much, man. Thank you for this conversation. Thank you.